We will come to order now. First of all, I would like to say good morning to everybody. Today is August the 28th, 2022, Bible study guide number 13. Today's title, Come and Enjoy. Come and Enjoy. The background scripture comes from Revelations chapter 22, verses 8 through 21. The printed text is Revelation chapter 22, verse 10 through 21. And this morning, our devotional reading will come from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. At this time, I would like for everyone to join me in a verse of song. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry why on others thou art calling do not pass me by I'm calling you Savior oh Savior hear my humble Why on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. I'm calling you Savior, oh Savior, hear my humble cry. Why on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Good morning. This morning I'm reading to you from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 30. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have men over the fish and sea, over the fowl in the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creep upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, he him. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl in the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all earth and every tree and the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creep upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat and, is all, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. And even evening of the morning was the sixth day. I read from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. Thank you, thank you. Let us pray. This morning, Father, we come to you with thanksgiving in our heart. We thank you, Father, for just waking us up this morning. We thank you, Father, for touching us with that finger of love. Thank you, Father, for our help and our strength. First of all, Father, we want to thank you for your darling son, Jesus, that died on the cross, Father, for all our sins. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Father God, we want to thank you for just watching over us on last week. We pray that you just continue to keep your hands covered over us, Father. We pray that you touch our members this morning to come out of here and word from you, Father. We pray that you just continue to be with each and every one of them. We want to send out a special prayer for the family of Sister Virginia Crump this morning, Father. We lost one of our good soldiers this morning. We pray for our sick and our shut-in. We pray for our bereaved family. We pray that you bless our services this morning from the Sunday school throughout the morning service. Bless the pastors. He brings the word. Bless everyone that's bowed with me in prayer. These blessings we ask in your darling son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall not. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. 
I'm on my way to heaven. I shall not be moved. I'm on my way to heaven. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. I would like to thank everyone for participating in our opening services this morning. And at this time, we will turn it over to Reverend Connor for our Sunday school lesson. Thank you, Pete. Praise the Lord, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? As Deacon McKenzie had stated, let us be in prayer for the Crump family. Uh, Sister Virginia Crump that passed along this week. So let us pray for the family, uh, the Crump family this week. And so, truly indeed, God is good and just giving praise and thanks to our Lord and Savior just for allowing us to be here this morning. Um, and this morning we do have a wonderful lesson in store talking about come and enjoy, come and enjoy. And so this morning as we prepare our hearts and minds for the lesson, um, let us just continue to be in prayer for our communities, for our families, um, and mostly for our nation upon this week. And so our lesson this morning is come and enjoy, come and enjoy. Our Bible background comes from Revelation, Revelations chapter 22, verse 8 through 21, printed text Revelation uh, 22, 10 through 21, and our devotional reading came from Genesis 1, 26 through 31. And so our aim for change this morning tells us that we will survey the biblical references to the second coming in order to see the importance of this hoped for reality. Rejoice that the invitation from Jesus to be um, a part of the new creation continues through the end of all things and embrace the call to become part of God's kingdom. And so talking about come and enjoy, Revelations 22, 10 through 21. And so our first uh, thing we'll look at this morning is our background. And our background tells us the context of the last chapter of the last book of scripture brings human history to a close. And so, like ultimate bookends of man's uh, inimitable story, our beginning and our end are contrasted and captured by authors Moses and John. And so in Genesis, the serpent tempts the first Adam, and, and he falls, and paradise is lost. But now in Revelations, the serpent, the serpent is destroyed, and the second Adam is victorious, and paradise is restored. And so the significant elements of the garden paradise were two people, the tree of life and the river that watered the garden. And so in the New Jerusalem, the fountain of, of life flows from the throne of God and the lining both sides of the river are many trees of life. And so that are not only freely accessible, but ever fruitful for the enjoyment and healing of many nations. And so in Eden, one tree was forbidden, but in paradise, Nothing is forbidden. And so this morning, our, our first topic of discussion is going to be Christ is the coming, Christ is coming certainly and what? Quickly. So he's certainly coming and he's quickly coming. And so we're going to look at Revelations 22, 10 through 11. But I want to reiterate, Christ is certainly coming and Christ is quickly coming. So we're going to see if y'all going to agree or disagree with that. So let's look at Revelations 22, verses 10 through 11. Someone read those two verses for me. Revelations 22 and 10, and he saith unto me, Feel not the sins of this prophet, but this book, for the time is at hand. And he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filled still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Mm. Now, Deacon Walls, I wonder who's going to have a problem with those two verses. What you think, Sister Claire? 
Somebody got a problem with those verses. Jesus is coming certainly, and he's coming quickly. So now let's check this out. Daniel is given the command to, sh to, to shut thou up the vision and not yet reveal what the Lord says in Daniel, Daniel uh, 8 and uh, 26. But now the message or saying is given for what? Publication. While we cannot be sure of how this apocalyptic prophecies relate to each other, Christians can affirm the significance of the second coming of Christ. Because the word at hand is the Greek term ingos, which, which means near, nigh, or ready. So this is breaking news uh, the church needs to hear. And so we can begin to watch and do what? Pray for Christ's second coming. This is an evangelistic word for the church. The gospel of Christ is to be what? Revealed, proclaimed, and told to all who will hear. For all too soon there will be no more opportunity to repent and receive the grace of God. I got time. I, I got time. How long do you have? While urgent, the message is still positive because it implies that right up until the end of life, there is still time to do what? Choose. But when is Jesus coming, Sister Clara? He's coming certainly and quickly. Now I know 2,000 years, Deacon McKenzie, no, he ain't came yet. Lord ain't came yet. I still got time. See, we get complacent because in our minds, in our view, oh, he ain't coming yet. I'm just 18. I'm just 65. I'm just 35. I got time. I got time. How much time do you have? People are leaving this world every day. How much time do you have? Do you know when your day is? I can be the first to raise my hand in Sunday school class. I don't know when I'm going to leave this world. You don't know. But, Sister Ghost, we do know this. It's coming. And what we need to do right now is get ready. <laughs> Start preparing. Because look at it like this. Deacon McKenzie, do you have a job? You got a job. When do you prepare to go to work? <laughs> you prepare every morning. Why do you prepare every morning to go to work? Because if you don't go uh, get ready, somebody else might have your place. You might get fired. And, and, and also, deep he don't know what he's going to be facing that day. But you got to prepare what? You got to get your clothes ready. You, you prepare for, prepping uh, for what you're going to wear to work. You got to get your breakfast ready in case you want to eat breakfast. You getting your lunch ready for what you're going to have for lunch. And then last is class, you getting your mind ready because let's just face it. You don't know what kind of hell you're going to deal with when you get to work. Because why? He's a supervisor. You don't know what you're going to deal with. You don't know how management going to act that day. You don't know how the, the workers going to act that day. So you preparing yourself physically and mentally for that day. Now let me back up a minute. Christians, why we ain't getting ourselves spiritually ready for the coming of Christ? See, we got to get ready. And so those of us that think, I got time, you don't know how much time you got. And so what Revelations is telling us is, the book of Revelations is telling us is, you need to prepare yourself now. Because why? While urgent, the message is still positive because it implies that right up until the end of life, there is still time to choose. But the big question mark is, 
you don't know when the end of your life is coming. So the urgent thing and the best thing for you to do is, is start preparing yourself when? Now. So what it also shows us is, it is almost not worth a person changing their actions because there is little time to repent. Look at verse 11. So the angel, he encouraged his unjust and the filthy to continue what? In their sinful ways. Look at what verse 11 says. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, what? Let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You have time now to get it together. But when that day comes that you don't know when it's coming, time is up, Deacon Wall. Look, time is up. If you unrighteous and you filthy and you unjust then, look, the angel's saying, just keep on doing what you're doing because it's too late. So it's vitally important for us to do what? Choose now. So that if we choose now, if we righteous then, we can still be righteous. If you're holy then, you can still be holy. So it's best to get it together now. So let's move on. Christ is coming as King and Lord. Someone read verses 12 through 16 for me. It, it's difficult to translate the Greek word uh, taught you here, but the King James, King James translates, translators choose quickly over the possible literal, literal rendering of suddenly. So both of these words intend for the church, the bride of Christ, to prepare herself and be ready at any time for the return of her beloved bridegroom. So whether he returns quickly or whether he returns suddenly, both achieve the intended result of urging believers to be prepared for Christ's return. Why? Because no one really knows when it's going to happen. You don't know. You can sit here and do Da Vinci Code and all that other stuff all you want to. You don't know when he's coming. Christ here says he's bringing a reward with him to give to everyone. Now, you see, this is where folks get messed up, Deacon McKenzie. According to his work, shall be. Christians can look forward to being rewarded with eternity in the presence of God. Now, some might point to this verse to suggest that works based on what? Salvation. But this is to take the verse out of context. First, this verse alludes to two passages, Isaiah 40 and 10 and Isaiah 62 and 11, both of which use the same word, reward or, or recompense, and both of which refer to God coming to bring salvation, not a reward of good behavior. And then second, the New Testament elsewhere makes it clear that God brings salvation to his people on the grounds of what? Christ's righteousness alone. Not your works. Read the scriptures, Titus 3 and 8 and James 2 and 20. So they receive that righteousness by what? Faith and not works. Key word, they receive it by what? Faith, not works. 
So in what sense does Christ reward each one according to his works? Look back at verse 11. Reveals the key. Each person acts according to his true nature and the state of his heart towards Christ. What does verse 11 say? He that is unjust, let him still be unjust. He that is filthy, let him still be filthy. And it goes on. He that is righteous, let him still be righteous. He that is holy, let him still be holy. So this verse is not intended to make a doctrinal statement, but rather was an exhortation to preparedness, which includes an ever-ready, healthy, fruitful, works-producing what? Faith. It all goes back to what? Faith. Your faith should produce what? Works. So let's look at it a little further. A positive take on this verse is that Jesus will come with what? Rewards. Wages or payment for what? Services. For those who have been what? Faithful. That that word is again. Those who have been what? Faithful. While no one is saved by works, those who are saved will be rewarded according to their works. Now, how do they get these works? Through faith. If Genesis and Revelation are the bookends of human history, now let me go back, because maybe, maybe they still ain't got it yet, demon kids. Let me back up. Let me back up. So, Mr. Scott, you telling me if all this giving I'm doing, all this coming to church I'm doing, all this um, um, evangelism I'm doing and all this preaching I'm doing and all that stuff, that ain't going to get me in heaven. That ain't going to get me my reward. What y'all think? So let me clarify. So Spargo, I'm in the United States Air Force. I wear a uniform. But I sign on the line that I will honorably faithfully serve my country. James B. Connor signed the dotted line, but I wear a uniform. Now, Deacon Wall, you can go down to the Salvation Army, the thrift shop, wherever. You can get an old retired uniform and you can put it on. You can even go get your name tape, Walls. Put it on the uniform. You got a uniform on? I got a uniform on. Here's the difference, people. Whose name is on dotted line? You're a pretender. I'm a real soldier. My name is on the line. So when my president calls, whoever they might be, when they call and say, we going to war with whoever, uh, Master Sergeant Connor, get your bags ready. He calling me. He ain't calling you. you your name ain't on the line. And so what it tells us is this. Being on the Lord's side, we can all do works. But who's truly dedicated? Whose name is truly on the line? You got a whole lot of pretenders sitting up in church. They can give all day long. They can come to church every Sunday all they want. <laughs> but they ain't doing nothing else. You got to be a believer. You got to be true. You got to be what? Faithful. Your faith in Jesus Christ produces what? Works. So you can come in and work, but then you ain't got no faith. So you can give, you can preach, you can do all this other stuff. Believe me, people do it. But they ain't got no faith. They don't truly believe in Jesus Christ. They just pretending by doing the works. So what the scripture is telling us is Jesus is coming to reward those who have faith. And their faith has produced what? Works. As simple as that. So you can have a lot of folks running around with a uniform on, but they ain't put their name on the line. And when Uncle Sam does roll call, a call with soldiers, he gonna sit in the war. 
you ain't nowhere on the list. So, y'all understand that a little bit better now? Hope I ain't messed nobody up. So if Genesis and Revelations are the bookends of human history, Jesus is what? Uh-oh. There we go. Jesus is the holder of the bookends of human history. Jesus is the holder of the bookends both pre-existing and post-existing our temporal time frame. This is true not only in the sense of existence, but in character and holiness. Without beginning or end and without change, Alpha and Omega, Moab is one of the many self-proclaimed images of Christ. Jesus is the beginning. Jesus says he's the end. And he often applies himself titles elsewhere applied to who? God. Alpha and Omega, first and last, beginning and end. God is everlasting to everlasting. And he is the same yesterday and today and what? Forever. Know this identity of Christ gives Christians peace. If Jesus is the faithful and true king and par with perfections of Yahweh with God, how could he fail to come through on behalf of his beloved one? Look at the harmony and balance of that. God is beginning and end. Look at his son. I'm beginning and end. Look, they work right in tandem with one another. And knowing that Jesus is right in tandem with God, how could you not have hope? How could you not believe that what he says is going to come to pass? How could he fail us if he's in total alignment with God. And see, that tells us something, class. We need to be prepared and working each and every day, just like when Deacon McKenzie gets up and go to work. He's preparing himself every day. And in our Christian journey, we need to do what? Prepare ourselves every day. Do what? Pray without ceasing. We need to pray every day. We need to work on ourselves every day. It's a constant exercise, exercising of our faith every day. And if you have the faith and you're doing it every day, guess what you're doing? You're producing works. You're producing some self-work on you because you're working on yourself what? Every day. So, these verses remind the audience of what is at stake. Eternal blessing in the city of God or exclusion from it. So we might fear how exactly the world went in. Do y'all know how the world go in? Are you afraid of how the world go in? Now, while humankind bring about the end of the world through selfishness or carelessness, Believers do not have to worry about this, but can accept that just as God brought the universe into being, God will bring this age to a close. What part do we play in God bringing the universe into existence? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Now let me ask you this. Have we benefited from God bringing the universe into existence? Yes, we have. And if we remain faithful, so as far as go, we're going to benefit when he brings it to a close. Because now all this stuff we've been dealing with, it's going to be wiped away and we ain't going to have to worry about it no more. See, that is the greatest blessing of all. We talk about blessings, blessings, blessings all the time. We're going to get in church. We're going to shout because we were blessed with some money. We were blessed with this. We were blessed with that. We are blessed with our life, health, and strength. Boy, we, we have a good holy time. But man, when that day comes, when, when God brings it to a close, now that's the greatest blessing of all. He brings them reward deep because we have remained faithful. And our faith has produced some righteous works. 
and what Jesus is going to bring us then. Not Santa Claus, but Jesus. The gift he's going to bring us then on whatever day that it is, because you don't know when that day is coming, is eternal life. Now look at this. The word for dogs is used in the New Testament to denote spiritual scavengers and predators who work to do what? Undermine, hear that word is, the saving faith of others. In addition to these street scavengers, the city also excludes many of the same kinds of people just mentioned in the last chapter, uh, Revelation 21 and 8, which was what? Sorcerers, homemongers, murderers, idolaters, and liars. But this listing clarifies that the liars excluded from the heavenly kingdom are what? Those who do what? Love lying. Y'all know anybody that loves lying? <laughs> they just love it. I mean, the truth just can't be found in them, so it goes, and they just love lying. See, those are going to be excluded from the heavenly kingdom. Sorcerers, homemongers, murderers, idolaters, and liars. But get this. No mortal could be both root creator and offspring at the same time. Jesus was both Lord of David and the son of David. Now Lucifer once called the morning star has from the beginning lied to mankind and falsely presented himself as an angel of light. Jesus affirms that he alone is the true Morning star. He alone. Key word with morning star. I could break it down, but I'm breaking it down simply as this. It's light. What light is there in Lucifer? You can say darkness, but you can't say light. Jesus is the true, the true morning star. Because he alone brings what? Light, illumination, deliverance. He alone. Let's move on. Jesus is coming for the faithful who what? Belong to him. Let's close this out real good. Christ is coming for the faithful who belong to him. Someone read 17 uh, through 21 for me. And the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that hears say, come, and let him that is the thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that hears the word of the prophecy, prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man should take away from the word of the, of the book of this prophecy, God should take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He, that te he which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Mm. Quickly. You got it that day. Quickly. Both the spirit of God who indwells God's church and the bride of Christ, the church of believers, are invited. Those who have yet decided, decide for Christ, are also invited to do what? Come to the water of life. We, along with the Spirit, wait expectantly, but we also serve as a testimony that the human heart is satisfied by the coming of Jesus. And any who comes to him may freely drink of the water of life, both now and forever. And this invitation is strengthened and uh, complemented by the following warning. 
no one must add or take away from the words of Revelation. John, he urges the people of God to spurn false teaching and idolatry. The church's faithfulness is demanded in return, a faithfulness springing from what? True faith. Don't take away, don't add to it. Look, teach it like it is. Believe it like it is. Shut up with your opinion. Well, I think it should be like this. Uh, 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 uh. If Jesus says this is how you're supposed to come to him, this is how you're supposed to come to him. No one must add or take away from the words of Revelation. We are to remain what? Faithful. And that faithfulness springs from what? True faith. Although the warnings of verse 18 seem uh, to be applied only to John's vision, the warning not to add or to subtract from God's word is found elsewhere to apply to what? All scripture. Now, Sister Fargo, that just messed me up. So what this lesson basically telling me is not only does Verse 18 seemed to apply to only John's vision. But this warning also applies to what? All scripture. So let's look a little further. God would judge appropriately offenders for their violation of what? His word. His logo. His word. So we are to Teach God's word according to exactly just how it is written in scripture. We are to obey God's word according to just how it is in scripture, Deacon McKenzie. We're supposed to. But that goes against a lot of these prophets and evangelists and missionaries and preachers and deacons and Christians and stuff that wants to change up his word. What am I saying? We vilify and we put the stamp of approval on hatred. We put the stamp of approval on racial injustice, racism. We put the stamp of approval on all these different social issues and we say, well, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. And a lot of things we look at in the Bible, it's not there. Nothing in the Bible tells us to be um, racially motivated and stuff to be hating folks and mistreating folks and all these other different things. Because Jesus' word tells us to do what? Love all. Share the gospel to who? Everyone. There is no difference in that, Sister Ghost. We're supposed to love regardless of skin color, regardless of nationality, regardless of anything. We're supposed to love. You know, even the people that are committing sins and whether they're homosexuals or whatever, we're still supposed to love them. Because we say it in church all the time, love the hell out of them. We're still supposed to love them. I don't agree with your lifestyle. I don't agree with what you're doing. But I'm still showing you some love. Because at the end of the day, what? Love can win a soul over. Love can win people over. But what does hatred do? Hatred is only going to push them away. So, God will judge appropriately offenders for their violation of his word. His coming will be fulfilled as completely as a fulfillment of his sending the Holy Spirit. The comforting teacher of the church. The primary message for the church is to be what? Remain ready. To remain ready. And so church, are you ready? The book of Revelation started with the spirit. The church lives and exists because of the spirit. And individuals 
uh, believers are raised to newness of life only through being what? Born of the Spirit. The heartbeat of every Christian is what? The Spirit. The Spirit within you will confirm these words that when I come, whatever the day and year, it will seem to happen what? Suddenly. And would take many by surprise. All born-again believers will be ready because of the Spirit and will wait expectantly no matter how long it takes. Never give up. Never quit. Never get tired. No matter how long it takes. So Spargo, we're supposed to be ready and expectantly waiting for we ready. Lord, I don't know when, but I'm ready. Just like Deacon McKenzie said, he's going to go to work tomorrow. You're going to work tomorrow. He's going to start preparing for work. When? Tonight in the morning, he's going to start prepping to go to work, Sister Claire. We as Christians are supposed to be doing what? Every day. Preparing for Christ's return. Because when the Lord blesses and allows us to wake up, and see that new day, we need to be prepared. You don't know what you're going to face through that day. But Sister Pargo, you need to be spiritually set. You need to get your mind set because you don't know what you're going to deal with. And when somebody run in front of you or somebody say something you don't like, what's going to come out your mouth? <laughs> now, I'm just going to be real now. I'm just going to tell on me. When I don't put myself in the right mindset, Sister Pargo, I have a bad day. Look, you say something to me crazy, or one of my guards say something crazy and get to flying off the handle with me, look, I have a bad day. Termination might come out of my mouth real quick because I ain't got no patience. I'd be like, you fired. <laughs> I ain't even got time. You fired. I don't even know what's going on with him that day, Sister McKenzie. Look. I'm just, I ain't got time for it because I'm short on patience. But when I spiritually prepare myself for that day, I'm calm, I'm cool, I'm a little bit more tolerant. I can deal with it, I can listen, I can hear you, and then I can respond appropriately. But if you don't prepare yourself for that day, who knows what's going to happen? And see, that is why as Christians, we have to prepare ourselves just like we going to work every day. Christ, he came to bring us grace. By his grace, we can grow more and more into his image as his what? Beautiful church. Christ gave us grace. How can we grow more and more to be like Christ? Prepare ourselves daily. Work on ourselves daily. By his grace, we can grow more and more into his image. Isn't grace a wonderful thing? Because if we didn't have his grace, and that's what people have to understand. You don't want to go before God by yourself. You need to go to God with Jesus on your side. With Jesus in front of you. With Jesus on the left, Jesus on the right, and Jesus on behind. You don't want to go before God. God, here I am. What's up? You need to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. Wash white. You need to be covered. See, when Christ's work on earth was finished, he left to prepare a place for us. And as surely as he came according to his promise, he will return his promise for his bride. Until we are perfected in him, we can find no better comfort, stronger peace, or more enduring hope than the presence of his grace to sustain us until he, he returns. See, that is our comfort. That's what, look, we don't know when he's coming, 
But until then, we can find no better comfort, no better peace, no better hope than the presence of his grace. Because that's what's going to sustain us, Sister Clara, until he comes. Now, I'm going to ask y'all a question. How does this passage help you understand the book of Revelation as a whole? How, how does this lesson help you understand the book of Revelation as a whole? You know, I know some people get intimidated by, intimidated by all the imagery and all these different things. But when you break it down and really look at what it's saying, the book of Revelations is not a book to be fearful of. I think me and Sus Pargo had that discussion a few weeks ago. It's not a book to be fearful of because of what all it's saying. Look, it's actually, it's a book of hope. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> you should be happy. And look, and I used to be the same way, Sister Claire, look. I used to be scared to read the book of Revelation. I mean, I thought it was just a doomsday book. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> yeah. And when you look at the book of Revelation, it's a summation, really, of the whole Bible. Look, it's a summation of everything. And it's all it's simply telling you is, you can read Genesis and every other chapter, all Revelation simply telling you is, look, you got to get yourself together. You got to do it now. You know, because you don't know when the end's going to come. And see, you can't sit there and wait and say, well, I'm going to wait till I'm 65. You know, then I'm giving myself right to the Lord because, you know, I done sold my oats and I done parted and I done did all this stuff. I done been a little whole monger, you know, for all the years. I done did my thing. Well, I, I'm, I'm too tired and too old to do anything now. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to give my life to the Lord. How you know you're going to make it to 65? Yeah. That's what the Bible says. Study to show yourself approved. Yes, ma'am. You don't have to take anybody's word from the pulpit to the back door. You study. It's all in there. All in you. Think about The way I see it and understand the revelation in the whole Bible, we're in the midst of Alpha and Omega. Mm -hmm. The choices we make from that time from Alpha to Omega is your choice. You can choose to go to him or you don't. Mm -hmm. Ain't no in between. But, you know, that's, that's the way I understand it. We got power yeah. one way. unjust, then you all, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, look, let him stay filthy still. Not preparing yourself. And see, and that's what we have to do. You got to prepare yourself. You know, I tell my kids all the time, relationship-wise, don't get yourself bogged down, enjoy life, Cause look, it's only gonna happen once. So you young, don't tie yourself down so fast. 
Enjoy life. I ain't telling you to go out and be a dog and be a whole monger, but enjoy life. Go on trips. You know, <laughs> go enjoy life. Keep yourself in order, but enjoy life. Look, that's where you really enjoy life, you know. And see, for their youthful ages, enjoy this time. Because this time is going to come to an end. Because my son, you finna graduate high school. You got to get ready for the next level. You're going to go to college, you're going to go to work, what you going to do? Maturity level, got to change. But once that maturity level changes, Sister Claire, and you start getting bills and got to go to work. <laughs> you got to be what? Responsible. We have been trying to prepare you for this all these years. And see, in our Christian walk, we're supposed to be doing what? Getting prepared. Because you don't know the day, the time, the year. You don't know when the Lord is coming. But we have to work on ourselves now. And that's all the book of Revelation is telling us. Work on yourself because Jesus is coming with his reward to all those that who are what? Faithful. And their faith has done what? Produced works. Jesus is coming. Get ready now. Don't wait. Because this is if you sit around and wait and you think you got time. When you don't know when that time coming and he busts them clouds wide open, what he telling you then is, if you out there whole mugging now, just keep on doing it, baby, because it's too late, because I'm him. <laughs> you ain't got no time right now to say, Lord, forgive me. Not too late. So if you was unjust, just keep on doing what you're doing. Because Sister Claire, I'm here. So as we close, throughout church history, countless individuals have predicted with confidence, because they know when he's coming, the exact date on which Christ Jesus is coming, they know. He coming January the 1st, y'all, 2023. He coming. And then January the 1st, 2023, get here and don't nothing happen. So y'all start believing in your New Year blessing and all this other stuff goes. I'm going to leave that alone. Without exception, they have been wrong. As a result, the whole idea of expecting a miraculous return of Christ has been largely discredited in the minds of many. The book of Revelation, when it focuses on the return of Christ, does not list a series of mysterious hints that the church is left to decode, nor does it merely tell us what we want to hear, flattering us by sparing any sense of accountability, Sister Ghostin, and judgment at Christ's return. The book of Revelation focuses on the faithfulness and the preeminence of who? Christ. Because Jesus is the first and the last, the king of kings, the true descendant of David. The Christian can rest in his promises. Thanks be to God for what? His indescribable gift. Revelations is not a book to fear unless what? You ain't got no faith. Unless you a whole monger, sorcerer, idolater, liar, you ain't got no faith. But if you have faith and you prepare yourself daily, the book of Revelations is a joyful book to read. Because man, Sister Spargo, look at what we got coming for us. You welcome the book of Revelation. You sitting around chumping at the bigs. Lord, hurry up and come back. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks be to God. So this morning, I hope that you enjoyed this lesson this morning. I hope that you got something good out of this lesson this morning that would help you continue in your Christian walk. For those of you that are viewing this live, I forget it every Sunday, but you can give in the Sunday school according uh, on Givelify. If you want to give a Sunday school offering, those of us here at the church, we give. Uh, but you can give um, in Givelify if you want to give to our Sunday school um, this morning. But truly indeed, I pray that you was blessed out of this lesson. 
And I pray that the book of Revelations is not a book that you fear, but it's a book that brings you hope um, for your faithfulness um, in, in Jesus Christ. Because he is coming. And when he's coming, we don't know. But what we do know is we can prepare for that return now. And it's better to prepare now than try to wait till later. Because if we wait till later and then he comes, you ain't ready. And he tells us, if you are unjust, be unjust still. And so preparation is the thing that you have to do, what, now. And so may God bless you. May God keep you all. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the next lesson. Um, so we'll post it up later um, when our books get here. And we'll post up what the next lesson will be on. And so may God bless you. May God keep you all. We'd like to thank Rem Connor for that wonderful, wonderful lesson. I pray that you take that lesson and apply it to your daily life. Uh, as I was doing my studying on this lesson and when we got to the end, when everybody was making a prediction of, of when Jesus was returning, it brings me back to the year of 2000. You remember when everybody was saying that the world was going to end in 2000, everybody was buying water and bread and eggs and and I was saying, well, if the world going to end, why do you need water, bread, <laughs> and eggs? <laughs> you know, everybody was going buying all of this water, and I didn't understand. I'm like, why, why would you buy it if the world is ending? But, you know, we had a shortage at that time because everybody was running like uh, they usually do when bad weather's coming. But, uh, like I said, the Bible said no man knows. No man knows. So stick to the Bible. I pray that you come out and join us today for our 11 o'clock service. Uh, you don't have to stay at home. We do have masks and we still uh, practicing our social distancing. But uh, if you decide to stay at home, may God continue to bless each and every one of you. Have a wonderful day.